We come to Philippians and uh, continue this. I want you to know that there is both uh, the sermons available by video on our church website as well as by podcast um, that you can go to the website and find information on that as well. The sermon outlines are also there. You can download them and print them and use them for later study, if you would. Our church takes these outlines and uh, uses them. Many folks review on the evening after the sermon is preached tonight. Um, I want to encourage you to do that. You'll retain a whole lot more, and God will continue to use this message in your heart as we go. But this morning, we come to this uh, title, Christian Examples to Emulate. And you may ask yourself, that word emulate, I, I, we don't use that word every day, but it's a good word. We shouldn't lose it. We shouldn't let it go away. Um, and this passage, the, the passage that we're looking at here, um, shows us some Christian examples that we should emulate. When I graduated from Florida State, I went to work for an IBM company. And during those days, back so many years ago, there was something called the IBM 3090. And the IBM 3090 was a massive computer. It was a mainframe computer that would do all kinds of powerful things used in at various applications around the world. And uh, it would take whole rooms to house it with other people working in the big old magnetic tape drives that would uh, back it up and so forth. And the world was, was often run by supercomputers. This actually wasn't a supercomputer, but it was a mainframe computer that was very popular. Well, about the time that I came along, the 3090 had had, had a lot of impact around the world, but there were these new things that had also risen up in prominence, and they were called PCs. And um, in fact, IBM came out with a whole series of them called the PS2. And what started happening was these standalone PCs at your desk, especially if you could link them together, were very, very powerful. And in fact, eventually, they began to emulate, they began to work with and act like the supercomputers of the years before. And so when I was coming along, part of the work that we did was help PC networks, local area networks, be able to hook up to the huge mainframes and be able to emulate them. They could act like them and they could use them. So the word emulate means this, to follow or match or surpass either a person or an accomplishment. And so we look this morning at some passages of Scripture that lead us to two key figures that we are called to emulate. We are called to follow their example. We are called to work as under Christ and being like them. In fact, I want you to understand that as we've, as we've studied in the book of Philippians, there's already been a lot of instructions to that church and, and that kind of thing. In fact, the first half of what we see this morning is part of those continued instructions. You see it very plainly, and we've already studied this. In verse 14, it says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blaming in the world. But then we jump down a little bit. In verse 17, he says, and Paul's starting to talk about himself here a little bit, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. You see, we begin to see here in verse 18 that he's telling the Philippians, look, I feel this way, you ought to feel this way. I am thinking this way, you ought to think this way. And then he goes into verse 19 through 24. And um, verse 19 through 24, circle the word Timothy right there, because now we begin to see some biographical information on Timothy. We begin to see these individuals that are here. Now, the letter to Philippians, you say, well, wait a minute. Why is this important to us? Timothy's not about to come visit us. Paul is telling the Philippians, hey, I'm going to try to send Timothy to come see you in the midst of all your distress. And I, I want to be encouraged by what he's going to say when he comes back to me here in Rome. Paul can't leave. He's in prison. But Timothy is with him. So we start to see this correspondence that's going back about 
visits and other things that are going to happen there. And if we're not careful, we might be tempted to say, well, that really isn't telling me what I ought to do. That's not really seeking to encourage me. What value is that here? Well, I want to give you a key Bible study concept this morning, and you see it right here on your outline. There's a key Bible study concept that you need to lock into as a Bible-believing, Bible-studying Christian. The biographical and geographical information of the Bible is very important. It's very important. It's not there just kind of left over along with the important stuff. Like the rest of Scripture, it's very important. And what I mean by this is the people, places, events, and the relationships that we see there are very important. Fill this in. It is inspired and preserved by God. You see, we believe that every word that we have in front of us in the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant, and all-sufficient word of God of authority for us. Well, that means even the biographical information, and listen, even the geographical information. It's all been preserved by God for our benefit. Fill this in. We can gain from it. You can get something out of this. And it's not just that you can, you should. Listen to this, you need to. And it helps the whole Bible come to fit together like lock and key that much more. In fact, notice this next point here. Many times it serves to authenticate the reliability of the biblical record. There are many, many examples when a place is mentioned or an event is mentioned in the Bible that if you go dig around over in the, in the places where God did all of this work, when you go dig around in Egypt, when you go dig around in Israel, when you go dig around in the areas surrounding Israel, we find evidence that what the Bible said is true. And so it's really, and there's many, many, many examples of that. Um, But this comes to us through biographical information. It helps us see that this is a reliably, uh, a reliable record that deserves our attention. Notice number three. This biographical information, when Timothy is spoken of and and Epaphras is spoken of and various folks are spoken of, it shows that the letters are real. These aren't fake letters. These are very real letters that were written to very real people. Number four, it shows that their lives are real, that these people lived, and not only did they live, but they struggled just like you and just like me, or perhaps they grew like us. Number five, it also shows that the circumstances of their lives were real. It reveals to us that there were things going on around them that were very important and that we can also relate to. There was persecution in different cases. There was famine in different cases. There was, there was all kinds of other economic hardships or realities. Or listen to this, there were social injustices all around them. And so the Bible is not written in a vacuum of these social injustices or these pressures upon life. We see that they are here and that we can gain and learn from them. Number six, and this is very important, it shows that the relationships are real. And this is important because our God is a God of relationship, and He works through relationships. Tommy was just saying to us, man, we we miss you, we love you, we found fellowship up at uh, Louisville, and that's a great blessing to us, but but there's a a relationship where our hearts are involved because we've worshiped together and we've, we've experienced life together. For Tommy, he's grown up here, and Caitlin in many ways has grown up here, and so our hearts are involved. This is the the design of God, and we see this in the life of Paul, we see it in the life of Timothy, and we see it in the lives of the Philippians, and so we too can gain from these things. So, when we come across um, stories being being told in the Scripture that involve certain details of this, we shouldn't gloss over them. Um, How many of you have been tempted 
when you're reading the Old Testament to go to the genealogies and go, and so and so, and so, uh, okay, okay, now. And then you start again. Now, I understand that. And through osmosis, there's not gonna, nothing's going to happen from you reading all of those names, as so to speak, except that you should be exposed to the realities that are there. There, it, there is much that comes from the study of the genealogies. There's many things that we understand from the Scripture as we see God's work through His covenants in the lives of His people, we gain many things from those genealogies. They are important. They are not meaningless. God put those names there for a reason. And so there will be one place where you're studying the New Testament and you go, wait a minute, what is that referring to? I remember that from Genesis. And you go all the way back to Genesis and you start to see a correlation where God is showing that something he did long before is playing into something that he was doing in the, in the present New Testament and then even in our present, in our day and time. So we want to be careful to recognize that all of the Word is important to us as we study it and as we learn it, and we see that even this morning. Well, let's go and let's see. Um, we've already looked at 14 and 15 um, in a message, um, and we're going, to, uh, we're going to pick up really around verse 16 and 17, 18, and see some key things that happens with the life of Paul, and when, especially when we think about who he is and what we learn about him in this passage. And then we're going to see some things from Timothy that I believe will be very encouraging to you. So look at verse 16. He's saying, holding fast to the word of life. So that in the day of Christ, look what he says, I may be proud that I did not, underline it, run in vain or labor in vain. He's telling them to don't grumble, don't have all these unity issues and unity problems because I want to see that the gospel really has transformed who you are and that when it all gets said and done, that my work among you Philippians wasn't a waste. Number one, I want us to see here that Paul is truly in the game. He cares who wins and what is accomplished. Look at verse 16. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run or run in vain or labor in vain. He cares about what happens. He is running as to win. That's what it's talking about there when he says that I didn't run in vain. He is in the game. He is in the fight, you could also say. And, you know, unlike the chicken who just lays an egg for breakfast, you know, what, what does the pig do? He gives his life for breakfast, right? He's got some meat in the game. Uh, the chicken, you know, there's not, not much there that he's come, oh, lost another egg. Somebody came and took it. Um, and that's your breakfast. But the pig... You know, he's committed. We've always said that through the, through the years. We see that Paul is in the game. His whole life is in the game. He cares what happens in this. You know, there's some people who they live their Christian lives and they're not really in the game. They may be part of the, being in the spectator crowd. They're up in the stands and they're just kind of watching. And they may cheer a little bit here and there. They may even cheer passionately. But it really doesn't require very much of them. They're not in the game. These, these are ones who are in the game. And we are called to be in the game. Look at number two. We see that his life is a willing sacrifice. He's not only in it to win it, but he is willing to die for it. And we see in verse 17, he recognizing, you remember, he's in prison. He's not sure what's going to happen. In fact, we know what does happen. He eventually is beheaded. But look at verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. You see, he is a willing sacrifice. He's not going through this reluctantly and under compulsion. He's not, I guess I got to go to church. 
Yeah, it's not raining out there. It's actually kind of beautiful. Don't have that excuse. I mean, you know, there's no compulsion. He is ready to go to the next city, even though we see that very often trouble awaits. In fact, look at Acts chapter 20 in verse 24, 23 and 24, right below this passage. Look what he says, and this is, this is accounting part of what happens as he's on his way to Jerusalem where there's going to be trouble. Look what it says. I know that in town after town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions await me. Look at verse 24. Read the underlying portion aloud with me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. Let's read that again. But I consider my life of no value to myself. And look at the reason why. If only I may finish my race and complete the task I have received from the Lord Jesus. And what is that? the ministry of testifying to the gospel of God's grace or to the good news of God's grace. You see, that's what his passion was. And he was saying, I, I don't care whether I live or die because I know in the long run I'm going to live. I know what Jesus said. Jesus said, anyone who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. The apostle Paul is convinced of this and he's saying, I do not fear what man can do to me because I fear the heaven, the, the God of heaven and earth. And I am seeking to run the race that he's given me. I want to run it faithfully. And what is this race? It is to declare the good news of God's grace. You see, this is the, the glorious message that Christians have been given and the glorious task that we've been given. So, number one, he's in the game. Number two, he's a willing sacrifice. Number three, notice this, that even though he's in jail and even though he's writing to the people who are in trouble and suffering, look what he says, or look what it says here. Paul's joy is not derived from earthly comforts and pleasures. Now, part of the reason is that God took all the earthly comforts and pleasures away. And so the test is there. Paul, are, are, are you finding sufficiency of Christ, the, f the fuel for your soul? Are you finding that your, your desire for him is what comforts your heart? So the joy is not derived from earthly comforts and pleasures, but from the privilege of living and dying for Christ. And notice this with me, the, that he expects others to do the same. Look what it says in verse 18. We see this. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, it's not only glad and rejoice because he is positive about his circumstance, but he's saying, come and enter in with me. We see that the whole message of the letter is, come and enter in with me in the sufferings of Christ and find that he is sufficient. And so his joy is comes from something far beyond his current circumstances. Notice the next part here. Number, number four, and we see Paul's intense and Christ-based desires. And I, I want you to see this in verses 19 through 24. I'm going to read it again, and then we'll pick through it a little bit since this is the new passage to us this morning. We've read the others over the last couple of weeks. Now we've come to a new passage. Look what it says in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus. It's an interesting phrase. I hope in the Lord Jesus. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. So that, I, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. He wants to send Timothy, so Timothy will come back to him and bring him news about how they're doing. So, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. Verse 24, or verse 20. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, verse 23, I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me and I trust in the Lord. Here's another one of those statements. I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. You see, so Paul was optimistic about his chances of getting out and going to them. 
He was, he was thinking, boy, I'm going to get out of this jam. I've been in this jam many times before. They keep locking me up. If, if they don't let me out, maybe the Holy Spirit will let me out, shake the prison, doors fall off, and out he goes. He's just saying, I'm, I'm going to get out of this jam. And as soon as I, you know, we see that in movies sometimes. When I get out of here, you know, the, the criminal in the, in the jail, I'm, I'm getting out of here. You know, when I get out of here, I'm going to go do this. Well, the Paul, Paul is making plans. And here he's saying, I want to come back and see you. This is a church that he loved. But we, in this, we notice his intense and Christ-based desires. His intense in Christ. He's saying, I hope in the Lord Jesus. With everything he has, he's saying this. Notice the last one there. And I trust in the Lord that this is an intense desire that he has. And it is based in his love for Christ. So his hopes are not for himself. His hopes are not based on, upon his own agenda. He's saying, my hopes are in tune with Jesus. My hopes are in tune with the Lord of the universe. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you. I hope that I will come to you and I trust this in Christ. So that's an important thing that our motivations would be really, really rooted in the things that matter, in the one that matters. Look at letter A. His desire was submitted to God's will. That's what we see here in this phrase, I hope in the Lord Jesus. He's saying, I, I'm submitted to, work, to the plan of God. What is his plan? Letter B, we see his desire is dependent upon, upon God's will. He's saying, I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come too. So he, he didn't always get what he wanted and what he was asking for, but he's dependent upon God's will. Notice letter C. His desire was for the welfare of the Philippians. So this desire that was coming from the Lord was for the welfare of the Philippians. He wanted them to do well. You see, they are struggling. They're, str they're struggling in two ways, both persecution from the outside and unity from the inside. They had some unity problems. It's part of the reason he writes. But they're doing overall well. We see that. We pick up on that even here. But Paul deeply cares. Notice the last statement there. Paul deeply cares that they have the help that they need from good sources, not wrong sources. You see, we get the hint here that Paul could send someone to them that he didn't have a lot of confidence in. And he's not going to do that. He's very concerned about who would go. So here he is in Rome. He's in prison. There's Christians in Rome. Some of them are gathering around him. And maybe in part it's because they know this dude is powerful. This dude is known around the empire. I mean, even the Romans have locked him up here. And he still wields some power even though he's, from, even though he's in prison. So just kind of think about this. There's still people that quote-unquote call themselves Christians that are wanting to get near Paul, spend time with Paul, come visit him. He's under house arrest part of the time, and so they can come and sit with him. And they're hoping to kind of benefit in part from his popularity. Now, now the apostle Paul is saying, I'm not going to send anyone like that. I'm not going to send anyone that, with a word from me that they are given more, more influence and in fact, we detect here that even at that moment, Paul is discouraged about that. I mean, this, is, this has got to hurt his heart. It's got to hurt his heart that people are looking to ride his coattails a little bit and in, all in their own desires. Because you see, throughout the New Testament, we do see that false teachers keep creeping up. Either Judaizers or people that are, that are seeking to, you know, the, the Judaizers, they love the power of the law and the other things. So they're, they're, they're influencing the church to try to go back to the law. Oh, yes, you have Jesus, but you still need the law. And I mean, there were powerful people in that realm. And then there were other powerful pagans with various mystical beliefs that they would bring ring upon the church. So there's, there's constantly all of these things seeking to deceive the church. Sounds like modern day. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of movements around the world that do not clearly and plainly stick with the truths of the Bible. All kinds of different authors and all kinds of different speakers and all kinds of different movements that come along using the Scripture and its influence in part 
to gain their own platform. And we see the Apostle Paul is very concerned about that. Look at this with me again. In verse 20, he says, For I have no one like him, speaking of Timothy, verse 20, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. This is a great tragedy. If they're not genuinely concerned for their welfare, then why would they go and spend time with them and preach to them? What would their motives be wrong with? I mean, do we not see that in the book of Jude? Our church studied the book of Jude a couple of years ago. I encourage you to go read that. It's about false teachers that rise up and who preach and teach the gospel, who wield their authority over the church, and they do it for money, or they do it for sex, or they do it for power. Very, very plainly stated in the very first century of the Christian church. And it didn't say that they're coming. It said they're here. And that was in the first century. And for 2,000 years, we know that it's been a problem that men and women rise up seeking to lead the church, seeking to benefit from the church, and all for the wrong reasons. And here we see the Apostle Paul saying the same thing to them. It is a theme that is throughout the Bible. And it's throughout the Old Testament too. Men who were given influence, men who had power, and they did not direct the people to God. They directed the people away from God. What, what, a, constant, what a consistent and um, thorough problem this is in humanity, in the lost and fallen heart. But praise God that there are those who stay in the truth. And look at number five with me. Timothy, Paul's son in the faith, is being sent to help. Now you're going to see, especially here, why the biographical information and even the geographical type of information is helpful to us. Who was Timothy? Who was Timothy? Timothy is from a, a town called Lystra, which is in modern-day Turkey. He had a Jewish mother who was a Christian, so she was a Jewish Christian, ethnically Jewish Christian by faith, and he had a Greek, and we don't believe that his father was a Christian, a Greek pagan father who had not come to faith in Christ. There was no evidence that he ever came to faith in Christ. Look at the bullet point that is here. He's led to Christ by who? By Paul. We see that here in 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. We see references of this during his first missionary journey. We see that in Acts 14. You see, so it matters that we know about the trips. We ma it matters that we know what happens in the trips because it even plays out in the letters. And this is so cool. You can do, as you start to study the Bible and read the Bible, I know it seems overwhelming at first, but as you just start to read and you study and as you're taught here in the life of the church, you'll start to see that the whole thing fits together beautifully. And it's not too much to overwhelm you. You can come and gain and, and dive into the truths that are here. Notice the next part. His mother and grandmother instructed him in the faith. Clearly says this in 2 Timothy um, a, a couple of times that they instructed him in the faith. His father had educated him in Greek culture. Now, why is that important? Look at the next statement here. This uniquely prepared him for wor work with the Apostle Paul. Now, think about it with me. The Apostle Paul was a Jew who was called to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He was a Jew that was called to take the gospel right into the Greek Roman mindsets of the present day. And he needed someone who could do that with him. And here comes Timothy, born a Jew, from a Jewish mother, but being raised in, in being able to communicate in, in the Greek language that they had and in the Greek understanding of the world from his father. And so this is a beautiful picture. We see how God is using these two in this way. God has done things in your life. God has done things in preparing you for the ministry that he has for you, things that only you can do. This is part of the beautiful work of God's comprehensive plan in our lives, things that you would have never thought he could use or he did use in, in bringing you not only into the world, but through your education, through your upbringing, the shape of your life and who you are that God seeks to use powerfully. We see that happening in this young 
preacher named Timothy. Look at the next bullet point here. Paul called him, notice this, my true child in the faith, my beloved son, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, my fellow worker, our brother, a fellow bondservant. And actually, the list goes on and on. Paul talked about Timothy a lot because he used Timothy a lot. He would send Timothy to go do certain things. Notice this next point here. Paul went or was sent practically everywhere by Paul as a helper or a troubleshooter. So he would go to encourage people that needed to be encouraged. He would go to build them up or he would go to deal with wrong things that were happening in the churches. The apostle Paul would send him uh, to go and take care of problem areas. We see this in Rome, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, Ephesus, Crete, Jerusalem, Antioch. Over and over and over again, we see Timothy named with Paul being used in these ways. Now, look at the next one, number six. And we get this from verses 21, or 20 and 21. Timothy's devotion and godly motivation are rare. So Timothy is motivated, excuse me, uh, devoted and he is properly motivated. Look in verse 20 and verse 21, right below number six. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So this man, Timothy, is devoted, and he's devoted for all the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. In fact, We see this. Notice the next bullet bullet point there. Then, like now, many Christian leaders have had all the wrong motives. We've made a point of that all the way through this message already. They've had the wrong motives. But Timothy's motives are aligned with Christ's motives. So, he lines up with Christ. In verse 21 in letter B, or the second part of that verse, look what it says, not those of Jesus Christ. So that, that's the opposite of what the others have. But Timothy wasn't like them. Notice the next part. What are those motives? The motives are the welfare of the flock. The welfare of the flock is what matters to Jesus, and it's what should matter to true servants of God. And by the way, not only pastors and teachers and leaders, but it should be every member of the church. Because remember with me, this letter is being written to the whole church at Philippi, which means it's being written to us as well. And the value here is not just that preachers and teachers would care about the welfare of the flock, but the value here insinuated in all of this is that we should all care about the value of the flock. And so Timothy's devotion and godly motivation are very rare. Look at number seven with me. Timothy's worth was seasoned and it was proven. It was seasoned and it was proven. Look up there with me and look at verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you. Verse 20, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests but not those of Christ. Now look at this, verse 22, but you know Timothy's proven worth. How would they know that? Well, Timothy was with Paul when they planted the church at Philippi. Timothy, they knew. Timothy had been there before, and they knew his heart. They knew because not only the apostle Paul had sent him, but he used him in many ways. Look at verse 23. He says, but, or look at verse 22. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust that in the Lord that I shall certain come shortly myself. So let's look at this. Timothy's worth was seasoned and proven. Letter A, he had worked. He had worked in the gospel. He was not afraid of work. He had suffered in the gospel. 
He had suffered alongside Paul in the gospel. He had served. He had served many. We see throughout the New Testament record that he was known for having a servant heart. He had sacrificed. He had gone and and gone without time and time again alongside Paul. And he certainly had learned. We see that he had learned the gospel, that he was studying the gospel. In the letters of Paul to Timothy himself, how we see that he was growing and being challenged to continue to grow in the gospel. And that's the last one there, that he had grown in the gospel. Now, this is to be emulated. This is for us to be, to repeat. Look at letter B. He was not only that, but he was faithful without scandal and selfishness. And listen to this, in the midst of all the trouble, he did not despair. He continued in that. So he wasn't scandalous, he wasn't selfish like the others, and he hadn't given up and gone home like some. He hadn't thrown in the towel, and he hadn't abandoned the work. Now, friends, we are called to be people who do not run in scandal, who do not run in selfishness, and who do not despair and leave the work of God. We are called to continue in that. Look at letter C. Timothy was a man who truly believed the whole gospel. He understood well the picture that it's not only about salvation in Christ, but it's about serving Christ right through death into the halls of heaven. And we see this. So it's living now for eternity. That is the picture that Timothy was holding on to. And part of the reason he held on to this is because he had a faithful mother and he had a faithful grandmother who had shared with him and brought him up and taught him the things of God. Now, I I just want us to look at all of this for a moment and see the Apostle Paul and see Timothy coming alongside, working faithfully to honor the Lord. I have a few questions for you this morning. And I call them this, questions for honest reflection and application. The first question is this, do you serve the Lord? Do you? You say, well, pastor, that... If you, if you mean, am I called to be a pastor like you? No. Or a teacher like Jim or Ted or Susan? No. Listen, friends. Joshua stood in front of the nation of Israel and said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He looked at the whole nation and he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Either you're going to serve the pagan gods that are around us or you are going to serve the Lord. Who are you going to serve? And that means who is your life going to be lived for? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be the culture that's around you? Is it going to be for your family? Or is it going to be for God? So my question is to you, do I serve the Lord? That's a good question for you to ask. And here's another question. If not, why not? Have you been under the mistaken understanding that, oh, well, I'm just a... I'm just like a pew Christian. I'm just like a Christian that comes to church and then I leave. I I guess I'm serving the Lord by being here in the church. Maybe, maybe not. 
I mean, most certainly worship is a glorious way in which true Christians are going to serve the Lord. But if all that you do, if your Christianity is only played out in coming and you believe that sitting and listening to the preaching of God's Word and singing and maybe even giving is living your life for God, you could be very mistaken. Because the God of this book says it is to affect everything. It's to affect how you live your life and what you do and why you do it. And in this, we begin to serve the Lord. So we serve the Lord as we work in our place of employment. We serve the Lord as we are raising our children, seeing them as, as precious gifts from God that we are told in Deuter Deuteronomy 6 to teach them to love God. And how do you do that? That you talk with them when you rise up, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down. You see, that's serving the Lord, truly teaching them in accordance with what the Scripture says. It's in the way that we relate to the people that are around us. God has called us to serve Him. If you do not, why do you not? Is it perhaps that you do not truly know Him? I would encourage you to not leave this place today without recognizing that Christ indeed died for your sins that you can, so that you can serve Him, so that you can know Him, so that you can be transformed by Him. What about this one? If so, if you do serve the Lord, what kind of servant am I? Am I a servant like Timothy that works, suffers, serves, sacrifices, learns, and grows? Or am I a servant that Paul could not send because of scandal? because of selfishness or because of despair or abandonment? Are you the kind of servant that Paul could send? Let me remind you that it's through the grace of Christ that we are anything, and that's what the Apostle Paul would say. I am what I am by the grace of God. And so anyone who can do anything for God, if it is truly in the reality of the Holy Spirit's work, that's exactly what it is. It is God working through, the, through us. Galatians 2.20 says, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is is the power of the Christian life. And, you know, if, if we are given to scandal or selfishness or despair or abandonment, it can be that Galatians 2.20 is not centered on our heart. And so that we, by faith, run back to that place of his help. How about this one? In serving, are my motives correct? That's a key one. Are my motives correct? Um, we need to be careful that our motives are not so that we feel better about ourselves. Our motives are not so that we are seen. Our motives are not there so that we can have more influence or a better income or be thought well of. Our motives are to reflect Christ. And that's what Paul had confidence that Timothy would do. Am I devoted? That's a key question. Am I devoted? Am I, am I, am I, is my heart here? Is my will here in the Lord? How about this one? Am I learning? The Apostle Paul, in everything he knew, gives several statements throughout his work and his letters that he is always learning of the Lord, that he is ever growing. And my friends, that's what a true Christian is called to do, is to grow until the day that we see the Lord face 
to face. I, I have a question. If we were to draw the graph of your growth, would it be flatlining? Would it be descending? Or would it be ever inching onward and upward? My friends, God has called us to be learners. Uh, when we are learners, we are growing. That's what he does. The truth transforms us. So the question is, am I truly living in light of eternity? Am I living in light of eternity? That's what the Apostle Paul was doing. He was, his reward was not now. Don't pack up yet. His reward was not now. He understood that there was something far better coming. And so the Apostle Paul is imparting this to Timothy, and he's saying there is so much more. May we rejoice in so much more. Because that's what it does. When we begin to live as if it doesn't matter what they do to me, it doesn't matter where I am or what's going on with me, my hope and my joy is for the well-being of God's people and for the glory of Christ. You see, that's a joy that no one can take away. That's part of the reason the Apostle Paul didn't have a joy problem. He had learned to be content, as we'll study, in whatever case he found himself. Because his priorities were very, very different. So, the question is, Christian examples to emulate. Are you emulating these that are before us? You say, you want me to be like the Apostle Paul? No, even better. I want you to be like Jesus. The king of the universe, the one who died and rose again, and the one who said, be like me, follow me. Would you stand with me for prayer?